So hello. Uh, hi, uh, I'm here to talk about TSDB, uh, but what is TSDB? TSDB is the storage engine of Prometheus. Can I know how many of you here are running Prometheus in production? And how many of you are running Prometheus 2.0? Yep, you're all using TSDB, uh, the internal storage engine of Prometheus. So I'm Gautam. Uh, uh, I'm now a developer at Grafana Labs. I was quite recently a student. Uh, I am a uh, contributor to TSDB. And this talk is uh, about the past, present, and the future. It's actually quite funny. I just submitted a talk, hoping I'll figure it out when, I, when it gets accepted. Uh, and it did get accepted, so I think I put together a fun talk. So let's see. So before we talk about TSDB, let's see why it came, uh, like why we wrote it. So Prometheus first started in 2012, uh, when a bunch of SoundCloud engineers felt there wasn't a good uh, monitoring system. The first version of the storage engine for that time series database, or uh, the monitoring system, was actually completely level DB. The data was in level DB, the index was in level DB. Uh, it didn't quite scale well, so they, went, uh, they actually went ahead and rewrote the uh, data, which, is, which was the bottleneck. And the second version uh, had a level DB index with a custom data store, where they were compressing time series very well. Now, this was what uh, made Prometheus 1.0. And how many of you? ran Prometheus 1.x, some version of 1.x. And how many of you were quite happy with it? Yep, uh, like we, it, it, it worked really, really well. It could handle millions of time series. SoundCloud was like having millions of time series. And what started as 1.0 went through a lot of improvements in terms of performance, in terms of issues. And there was like more than one and a half year of development into 1.0, into the level DB index and the custom storage engine. But then came Kubernetes, uh, like, I actually wrote this talk, and then I saw Fabian's keynote yesterday, and I was like, shit, he talked half the stuff I wanted to. <laughs> Anyways, with Kubernetes, uh, there was a lot more series, like, there's a lot more dynamic environments, there's a lot more things happening, and this kind of wasn't working out. Like, even SoundCloud was facing issues. So Fabian, uh, the main uh, author of TSDB, he actually started experimenting on the side, and he came up with Tindex, which sounds like Tinder, but it's not. <laughs> yeah, it's a time-indexed uh, index. Uh, it's to index time series data. And actually, that experiment went quite well. Uh, but based on that experiment, he went ahead and re rewrote the complete thing, not just the index, and that was TSDB. And as he was re uh, rewriting, there's a funny story. So I, in my internship, uh, deployed Prometheus, and I wanted to contribute, so I started pinging people, and Fabian pointed me to to Tindex, then I lost, like most con uh, open source enthusiasts, I lost interest. But six months later, I come back to the project, and boom, Tindex became TSDB. And I was like, now I have to contribute. And that's where I, uh, I come in, uh, midway of TSDB development, and now I'm one of the maintainers. Yep, uh, TSDB stands for Time Series Database. But what is a time series? Time series is just a set of values, each marked by time, like whether in Copenhagen. At 10 o'clock, it's 11 degrees. At 12 o'clock, it's 15 degrees, and so on. And yeah, uh, like the number of people in this room, probably the previous talk had more people. This talk has less people, and so on. Yep, and you just don't want to measure a single time series. You want to measure everything, like CPU, memory, RAM, in case of operational metrics, the number of requests. And you want to measure it uh, by instance. But like, it's, it's a l bunch of time series. Like, whether in Copenhagen, whether in Hyderabad, stock market prices, and all this. They're like, not just one, but millions of them. But how do you name them? Like, how do you name the number of people in Hall 10? You just have a metric name and a bunch of key value pairs quantifying it. Like, for example, take the stock price of Apple. You just say stock price, ticker, and exchange. And you can have, uh, you can have thousands of series of the name stock price because there's like thousands of uh, tickers. Anyways, now that we know how to name all these millions of time series, we want to query them. Essentially, we, uh, we have a, uh, like you just select them, you just say, you specify the name of the uh, uh, metric, and boom, you get all the series that have that name. You can say stock price, and you have all your stock price data. And then you, if you want to have the specific price or specific thing, you just add conditions on the labels. Like, you can say city equals Berlin, and you get only the Berlin's data. Or you can say city equal to B, a, uh, city should look like B or star, like regular expressions. Like you can select all kinds of data. So this is kind of uh, the, f uh, the data structure of the time series database. You just have millions of samples. 
marked by time and millions of time series. Anyways, so TSDB, uh, the new engine in Prometheus 2.0, is actually an embedded time series database. So Prometheus imports it. If you write Go and if you want to do some number crunching that like, uh, requires you to handle time series data, you can probably go ahead and import Prometheus TSDB. It's actually a very simple interface. Like, I really like the interface. It's just like, uh, I mean, I'm just going to go through the basics so that, you know, next time someone wants to try it, it's easy. So you open the database by giving the logger, well, like, we don't have a global logger. We, you pass in the logger every time. <laughs> uh, uh, and you pass in the directory and a bunch of options. Cool. Now that you have a, a database, you want to insert data into it. So we have some sort of transactions, but we will talk about them later. So you create an appender, and you put all the data you want. Like, you just add all the data uh, you want to that appender, and then you commit it. Boom. The database will have your data. And if you want to query it, you give the timestamps, the minimum time and maximum time for what, uh, like, uh, for the samples you're interested in, and then you give the matchers. I said, you know, you have to give city equals Berlin, or name equals this. So you give the uh, matchers, and you get all the time series that you want. And if you, you like, how many of you write PromQL? How many, like, for how many of you th th is this obvious? Like, it should be for everyone, because essentially that's what we do. And the matches can be anything, actually. So it's an interface. We don't specify what kind of matches it should be. Like, it could be equality, regular expression. It could be some magic that you're writing. Uh, it's an interface. And that kind of allows you to select all kinds of data at once. Anyways. This is not an internal stock. Uh, Fabian gave an amazing talk on the internals of the database in PromCon. You just Google PromCon uh, Fabian, and you will get the talk. This is about what is great, uh, like, and what are the issues that we faced, and what is the future of TSDB. Like, performance. Trust me, everybody loves the graphs. Yeah, so we actually benchmarked uh, uh, Prometheus with the new database and the old one. And essentially, one thing we did is we had a lot of load, but also on top of the load, we used to re uh, restart half of the pods uh, every 10 minutes. Like, that's a lot of churn. It's as if you're deploying half your services every 10 minutes. And that creates a lot more time series. That adds a lot of pressure. And yeah, like, because I say it's better, People should be able to guess which is 1.x and which is 2.0. Yeah. It, like, uh, in terms of memory, we do like 3 to 4x better than Prometheus 1.0. CPU, we do the same. So, we actually run four Prometheus, two 1.xs, which uh, one, both of them are scraping, but one of them is being queried because we want to measure the query load separately. And the same thing for 2.0. And if you can see, uh, again, uh, Prometheus 1.0 takes like six CPU cores, but Prometheus 2.0 takes like one and a half. If it's being queried, literally nothing, very little if it's not being queried, which is great. Yeah, the disk writes. So this is something that is uh, little, that literally blew us away because if you can see, Prometheus 2.0 writes very little, but like Prometheus 1.0 writes like 80 MB per second, but they're scraping the same data. Why is that? So we want pr uh, crash resiliency in Prometheus. So what uh, what 1.0 does is, uh, if periodically, it just checkpoints all the data it has in memory to disk. And if it crashes, it restores from the checkpoint. Now, that essentially means you're writing the same data again and again and uh, again to disk. And that actually has a lot of writes. But what we do here is we have a write-ahead log, which we will also see has a lot of other uses. Uh, we only, the moment a sample comes in, we write it to disk, and that's the only thing we write. Uh, only time we write that sample to disk. Like if we crash and we, if we restart, we just read the whole uh, write-ahead log instead of a checkpoint. It works. Yep. Uh, the other thing uh, is the on-disk size. Again, as Fabian expl explained on Prometheus 1.0, the per series overhead is a lot. Here it's like uh, very little. So what we were doing is every 10 minutes we were restarting the pods. Right, uh, which means a series lasts only for 10 minutes, and in 10 minutes, it turns out the amount of data we store is less than the data required to have a single series in 1.0. So that adds a lot of on-disk size, but if you are having longer series, it shouldn't make a difference. Yep, coming to query latency. Yeah, uh, one of the things you should observe about the previous graphs is that all of them are consistent, while 1.0 is flaky. 
And that is really important for queries. We want consistent, uh, consistent queries, and that actually turns out to be very good in 2.2. Anyways, now comes snapshots. How many of you ran 1.0 in production and wanted backups? And how many of you were frustrated by the reply, stop Prometheus, back up, back up the disk, and restart Prometheus? Yeah, uh, that, was the, uh, like that was the problem we had in 1.0. We couldn't support backups. And again, with the structure of TSDB, we could easily support ultra-fast back backups, like snapshots. It's like literally taking a picture. So what we do is, so what we have is, essentially, we have a lot of immutable blocks. It's like SS tables. You write the recent data into memory, and once the data is old enough, you flush it to disk. Now, these blocks are immutable. Now, we use that property. What we do is, we, have a, we, we take the data directory, and all these immutable blocks, we just do a, sim, a hard link, which is a syscall. And then the in-memory in data, we just write it to disk. Turns out, the syscalls take like milliseconds, and writing to disk uh, of the in-memory data takes like maybe 10 seconds on a very loaded server. Like you have ultra-fast backups, which are online. Uh, and then the other thing is, how many of you deleted data in 1.0? So essentially, some of the use cases we had was somebody wrote some, uh, somebody wrote, uh, uh, like had a bug, and then you had like a million time series with a user ID somewhere. And suddenly, you, your Prometheus is not usable anymore. You fix that bug, but your Prometheus is still not usable anymore because you have too many series. You want to delete those. And now the thing is, for, fifth, uh, like for five days, you have the right data. For one hour, you have the bad data. And then for five more days, you have the right data. You just can't clean up only the part you want. You just have to throw away the whole thing in 1.0. In 2.0, we have granular deletes. Uh, you can just specify, I just want to delete this one point in this one series, and you will be able to do that. Uh, so yeah, so how do we do that? We just uh, actually, uh, inst instead of modifying the immutable blocks, we write tombstones. And tombstones just say, hey, for this series, just don't look at the, dat uh, look at the data from timestamp 100 to timestamp 200. And the, when, when the querier runs, it just picks up these ranges and just doesn't query them. And we do periodic cleanup in terms of compaction, where we clean up the tombstones and actual data. So you, trust me, it just works out. And now, how many of you understand what is isolation in ACID? So uh, like this is a very rare case in Prometheus. So we have histograms in Prometheus. And essentially, when you scrape, a histogram is like uh, 50 different series. And you have to update all of them at once. But sometimes that doesn't happen. Let us see why. So this is a time series. We, we have like several time series. And we have a, uh, we have a scrape that is writing data to all these time series. And so far, the go routine that is writing the data has written to these time series. You can have a reader, you can have a querier that goes from below, and it, it just slowly reads back. And suddenly, you, you see a partial write. Boom. Like half the buckets in the histogram are updated, but half of them are not up updated, sometimes breaking your alerts. Now, this is a hard problem to solve, but because uh, uh, we have a lot of, uh, uh, like we kind of rewrote it from scratch. It kind of became much easier to solve it. And yeah, uh, the PR is open and conference-driven development. So essentially, Brian Brazil, uh, he essentially went ahead and wrote the whole thing in July 2016, 2017. Yeah, July 16, 2017. And it's just been, uh, uh, it's just there. And yeah, I just wanted to talk about it. So I went ahead and rebased the whole thing. Uh, and hopefully soon we'll have isolate, isolation. Now some of the gotchas of be, uh, building a database. How many of you here has, have built a database or a high performance service? Yeah, he probably knows the issue. <laughs> so allocs, what are allocs? So essentially whenever you create a new struct or whenever you create anything, like a new variable, you allocate memory to it. Yeah, true. You, you, you might throw away the struct or the variable later, and garbage collection kicks in, so you're not too worried. But what is this thing that is happening? So these are all compactions that are happening. So we are essentially merging two different blocks into a bigger block. And suddenly, there's a sh shoot up of memory that, I that, that is being used. And that shouldn't happen. Now, why is that happening? We went in and we saw. Turns out, structs take memory, like several bytes. And we have millions of chunks. Uh, essentially, we have millions of structs, and we are compacting, we allocate all these structs. And suddenly, uh, for a few seconds, we allocate gigabits of data. 
and suddenly yeah gc will kick in but it if it kicks in too late the oom killer will kill the kill the service and also allocating memory is very cpu intensive uh and it just slows the whole thing down and yeah and turns out we were doing this all over the place so we wrote the database it works so we went back and we profiled it like we profiled it using prometheus again and we looked at all the kinds of things and we slowly started uh, saving a lot of allocations but how do you save on allocations any guesses yeah arena allocation hmm arena allocation ah Ah, uh, okay, yeah, something like that. So yes, essentially, you have a struct which you allocated. You store it somewhere. Like you, you don't throw it away. You store it somewhere. And if you want a new struct, you use the previous one instead of allocating it again and again. I think it is similar to that, but I'm not sure. Yeah, essentially, what we had was we have something called chunk meta. We store data in chunks, and we have millions of. When you have millions of series, you'll have millions of chunks, and the chunks don't store much. They just store the reference, which is a uh, int. the min time and max time which is an int 64 again 64 bytes and a, a pointer to a chunk again not much but when you add it up into millions boom suddenly you have a big gc spike yeah so you use something called sync pool in golang so essentially you have a pool of structs like uh, yeah sync pool is very nice you just have a pool of structs and whenever you want a new one you try to pick it from the pool if you if it's not there you create it but once you want to uh, throw it away you don't let the gc eat it you give it back to the pool and you kind of reuse the same thing and we were creating a lot of these chunks very fast but we were also throwing them away very fast but by using sync.pool by using by pooling we saved a lot of these allocs yeah so this is some of the example a small example of the sync pool in golang if you want to use bytes for example this is what you you do So essentially, you create a pool, and then you get a byte from the pool. If it's not there, it creates a, a it creates that byte, and once you're done with that byte, you put it back. Yeah, uh, it turns out, yeah, we had to fix allocs at a bunch of places. Yeah, you can see all this alloc save, nice PR name. <laughs> and yes, we are still not done. Uh, Yep, we are trying to reuse memory wherever possible, and this is again an open PR that is there. Yep, this is a funny one. This is an interesting one. It's called YOLO string. <laughs> so what happened is now you have these persisted blocks. You are trying to read uh, data from the blocks. Now, a da data has a lot of these strings, the metric names. We don't want to allocate those strings. Like we thought, okay, too many allocs. We don't want to allocate these strings. So we did something called YOLO string. we used uh, golang unsafe <laughs> and so how many of you can understand the function that is here yeah i'm sorry for you <laughs> <laughs> yeah so essentially uh, it says hey take uh, this byte slice is a string please assume it's a string and uh, yeah it's great it is a string for us great but only as long as if, uh, as long as the byte slice is there what if the byte slice goes away what if gc uh, the garbage collector takes away the byte slice boom if you try to use the string you're dead so that is what happened when we tried to use yolo string yeah so what we do is we mmap the data so we actually use mmap for these persisted blocks and later 30 days later or whenever you hit your retention we delete the block but then you are deleting the block and you have a querier that has the string and yeah if you delete the file we lose the bytes and the moment we lose the bytes we act, try to access the string and we, it used to crash we're like okay this error should not be there in go like why is this even happening in go go is supp uh, supposed to make sure that you never hit this but we hit this because we were stupid enough to use unsafe <laughs> yeah uh, yeah and then there was this pr allocate and cache strings for persisted blocks turns out we did something called premature optimizations we tried to uh, we thought allocation of strings is too much but turns out it is not yep files and windows so we are all uh, mac or uh, linux developers and we go to 2.0 we had a bunch of rcs betas everything was working we finally launched 2.0 and somebody comes and says it doesn't work on windows and we're like okay we have no clue why it doesn't work on windows but again uh, it being an open source project a bunch of people went ahead debugged it and turns out windows doesn't let you delete a file before you close it 
and we were doing it in a bunch of places. We just, like, yeah, <laughs> we were deleting a file before we closed it. And we were also having a lot of uh, these uh, file descriptor leaks uh, and stuff. But yeah, uh, Windows development is a pain, as I've learned when I set up my own Windows system to debug this. I was like, I gave up halfway. I don't care about Windows. <laughs> yep. Uh, yep. Uh, now I'm done with the gotchas. Coming to the future. Uh, what is uh, left to do in TSDB? Like, TSDB is being used in 2.0. We've done everything we wanted to do. Like, we fixed isolation, which is one of the rarest bugs ever, and uh, stuff like that. But I think, I'm like, I'm really excited about what's coming uh, for the next six months in TSDB. Uh, one of them is backfilling. How many of you wanted to backfill into Prometheus? Oh, that's a lot of people. And what was the answer? <laughs> yeah, uh, we said nope. Uh, sometime in the future, but not now. And it will be soon. And again, the reason we didn't want you to uh, let you backfill your data is because each series was a file. And if you're backfilling into millions of uh, uh, series, you're touching millions of files. It just doesn't scale in 1.0. But in 2.0, we can do something very clever. So we say these are the immutable blocks. Like we say the uh, first block has data from T0 to T1. T1 to T, uh, T2 has the second block. We just do something very clever. We just say, hey, you take your backfill data and plop a block in. And then we, we use, it. so a block is an interface. It's not an actual thing. So you can have anything as a block. So what we do is we have a big block that encapsulates all this and merges all the data. So this is something that I want to work on next. It has a little gotchas. How do you deduplicate and stuff? But I would love to see someone else do this because, come on, community. <laughs> Yeah, I was, uh, too many things to do. And the other thing, write-ahead log-based replication. So we have a write-ahead log, and it's one of the uh, one of the things that gave us a lot of benefits. Uh, like the startup times are instantaneous. Like it's very fast to restart a Prometheus. In 1.0, you had to go through the checkpoint and a lot of other things. And the other thing that uh, the write-ahead log will let us do is uh, replication. But why do you, why do we want replication? So how many of you heard of remote storage in Prometheus? How many of you use remote storage in Prometheus? So yeah, so I'll tell you how remote storage in Prometheus works. So you get a sample, Prometheus scrapes a sample, you send the sample to remote storage. Now a sample is six, eight bytes and eight bytes. But then with that, you send also all the strings, all the labels, everything with that. So essentially you might send a lot more data than you're supposed to. Yeah. Uh, but with the write-ahead log, we just replicate the write-ahead log. We'll make it an interface. We'll make a library around it uh, so that anybody can integrate with the write-ahead log, and it's much more efficient that way. Yep, uh, there's a proposal open on Prometheus Dev mailing list. Just Google Prometheus Dev write-ahead log replication, and it would be if you're interested in it. I would love your thoughts on that. Yep, the future is bright. I don't have the goggles, but yeah, <laughs> uh, there's a lot more things happening. Uh, it's a library. We have a lot of users uh, using uh, using TSDB. Like people are trying to do their own analytics stuff. People are building databases on top, and that is one of the reasons we we built TSDB. And I want you guys to look into TSDB, see if it's applicable for your use case. If you're if you're uh, touching time series data, you probably want to look at this. Uh, a little gotcha. This is in process, and it's a single node one. It's not a replicated one. If you want an, if you're okay with an out of process with a little latency, influx is much better, or maybe just use Prometheus. And one more thing, uh, one of the use cases uh, of this being a library is uh, Thanos. Uh, how many of you saw Avengers? Here, Thanos is the good guy. <laughs> Yeah, uh, so Thanos is a long-term storage for Prometheus. So what it actually, so what every other remote storage solution now does is it reads from this remote uh, remote storage data that Prometheus sends to that, that thing. But because TSDB is a library, anybody can write a uh, thing that manipulates the data. So what Thanos does is it has Prometheus, it has a sidecar, and it has these blocks, immutable blocks. So what Thanos does is it uses a sidecar to ship all these blocks to object storage, like S3, GCS. And then uh, it uses a library, again, the TSDB, to read the data back from, uh, so it has a querier and it has a store. The store reads the data back from uh, the object storage to give you long-term storage. So essentially, you don't need to care about replication, X, Y, Z, because you have your S3 or GCS caring about all that. Uh, 
And one of the wins of TSDB is uh, the store, which is essentially uh, written because TSDB was a library. If it was like a custom format inbuilt into Prometheus, it would have been very hard to implement this. Yep, also a gentle reminder, we have PromCon coming up. It's, a, it's actually the one conference I'm lo looking forward to because it's just so small. It's like 220 people, very cozy, very dev, very like, and it's in Munich, it's very nice. Uh, if you are users of Prometheus, if you have use cases for TSDB, if you're already using TSDB, thinking of using TSDB, come talk to me, submit talks. We have the CFP open for another two weeks or so. It's in August, it's sunny, and it's in Munich. It's, there's good beer. <laughs> yep, any questions? Mm -hmm. uh, you had the option to use uh, TSDB options in block uh, duration in, uh, in block, mark block duration. Now I don't see them anymore. Yes. Uh, so, so now we have TSDB and uh, it's a library. So we have this block size options. Turns out. Uh, they are advanced user options, and we don't want people to meddle with them because that breaks setups and that actually broke setups. Those options are there because uh, we wanted to do some uh, testing locally. Uh, essentially, we scrape every point, uh, every point two milliseconds, and we have like a 10-minute uh, block size because we want to hit compactions. We want to have the same amount of data and stuff. But it's uh, the defaults work really well, which is why we hit them. Uh, but the funny thing is, if you try to use them, they still work. They're just hidden. They're not visible. I noticed that, and I also noticed that in Dallas, you should set them uh, explicitly. So huh. Funny, because that shouldn't be the case, uh, probably in the initial days, but now it's like defaults. I was about to ask Ah, OK. Any other questions? Hmm? Ah, so th so th so that's one of the parts of the the controversial part of the future that I want to see because uh, so essentially I want to have the time series to be an interface. Like so right now, the time series uh, values are only floats, but in the future I want to put strings in there, maybe logs and stuff. But uh, it's all uh, like well, first thing is if you put it if you make it an interface, you kind of have a big uh, performance penalty, and we don't want that. Uh, so first the thing is. TSDB was built for Prometheus. Oops. Oops. <laughs> yeah, uh, TSDB was built for Prometheus and it should work for Prometheus primarily. And if that, if, I'm still experimenting. Like, trust me, I'm, I'm going to do this at some point. But if it turns out that you can have interfaces for values rather than just floats, I would, have, I would do it in the future, but sometime in the future. I can't guarantee it. You're welcome to talk to me if you want to experiment with that. It is definitely possible. Yes, only if the blocks are in S3 and it takes some time. Question. Yeah. <laughs> so one of the things is uh, we reduced allocs, we reduced memory usage and everything. Before, the storage used to show up in the profiles. Now the query engine is showing up in the profiles. And the first, the thing that is, uh, that's another open PR is optimizing the query engine. Now going back to Thanos, uh, Thanos puts the blocks in S3 and the block only goes there after two hours. Uh, so essentially, like, yes, you can have a horizontally, horizontally scalable stateless querier that just reads from the blocks, but that has a delay of two hours. And if you want to bridge that, there's a way you can make Thanos query your local Prometheus, but the local Prometheus will still have that query overhead. But yeah, it's getting better. Probably in 2.3 or maybe 2.3.1, we will have a much better query engine. <laughs> 